Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Engineering Dynamics. In this video, we will be talking about the principle of virtual work and how an analytical approach to mechanics can help us get the equations of motion in a more simple manner. So let's jump right in. Like I said, we are talking about an analytical approach to mechanics, and this approach is based on the concepts of energy and work. So we're thinking about how much energy is in our system, or how much work is done by the forces that are inside our system or that are acting on our system. And this provides us with a better understanding of mechanical phenomena. We have three main points on why we should use the analytical approach. Well, first of all, the most important is that we simplify the formulation of the system of equations of motion. So we're not only talking about one equation of motion, but we have multiple bodies and thus multiple equations that are coupled with each other. So we have a whole system. Second of all, we allow numerical methods to solve those systems. And the third, also very important, is the concept of constraints. So we're not looking at constraints as something that is negative, but actually something that we will use to our advantage to get the equations of motion. To understand the principle of virtual work or the analytical, analytical approach, we will first look at an example. So here we have a simple point mass pendulum. We have mass m, length l, and angle theta. And we know all the forces that are acting on our system, and all we already know the equilibrium. So we know that the acceleration of mass m in direction x is equal, so m times x double dot is equal to the force of gravity plus some reaction force that is keeping the point mass on its track. So we have gravity in this direction and reaction force x in this direction. The whole thing can be translated to the direction y. So we have m times y double dot is zero gravity because zero gravity is acting in the y direction, but we have a reaction force, this one. And the reaction force results in this direction, and here we have the reaction force, it is minus r, so a scalar, and then just the direction in the direction of, so it's a unit vector in the direction of our, uh, let's say, our constraint, so our string that is holding the point on its path. Then we have, of course, the constraint, so x squared plus y squared equals l squared, because if we wouldn't have this one, our point mass could move in any direction possible. But it can't because it's connected to a string or a fixed rod. So this equation will keep it on its track. Together, this is called a algebraic differential equation system because we have x double dot, this is our differential part, and we have x squared plus y squared equals l squared. And this is our algebraic part. And now you might think, well, we have three equations uh, equations and three unknowns. We could solve the system, but this is way too complicated for such a simple system. And you are right. And to understand this, or to understand how we can get the principle of virtual work, the, the equation of motion for this case, we will use the principle of virtual work. So before we do that, we have to revise our scalar product. So we have the scalar product, sometimes also called the dot product. We know that scalar product is some vector transposed u, uh, some vector transposed times another vector, and if the vectors are orthogonal, the result is zero. If we have, for example, vector a and b, and they are not, so this is not 90 degrees, the result is not zero. Here we have, for example, uh, one zero times two zero zero, and that is two. And we can use the scalar product to project one vector onto another one. So this is done like that. So we have the vector i and we have the vector j, and we want to project i onto j. First we do i transposed j divided by the length of j squared times the times the vector j, because j is of course our direction that we want to go to, we scale it down with this one, and we have the length with i transposed j. 
So now we have 2 divided by 4 times 2, 0, 0 equals 1, 0, 0. And we know that our vector p, this one, is exactly 1, 0, 0. So we projected i on top of j. And if the vectors are orthogonal to each other, there is no projection because we can't flip it onto the other one. So it just disappears and it's zero. So the most important thing to remember is that the scalar product and the dot product is a projection. Now let's talk about the configuration space. So the configuration space is basically all the points that our system or our mass in this case can take. So because it is fixed with a rod or a string, it can move on a circular path. So here we have our circular path, and this is our configuration space, because this is the sum of configurations that our system can take. And we know that a pendulum can move only in a tangent to that path, to our configuration space. At every point, it could move either in this direction or it could move in the other direction. And now we're thinking about, now we will think about how the particle could move. So the virtual part in the virtual placements is that we're not actually thinking about where the particle is moving to, but we're only thinking about where it could move to. So we know that it could move either in this direction or it could move in this direction. So it's the possible direction, our possible virtual displacements. We will never move in this direction because here we have the constraint. If you imagine a pen, you can only move in a tangent, but you can never shorten the pen because we of course have our algebraic part that is keeping the length constant. So mathematically it keeps the length constant, but physically of course you can move in the direction of the pen. So our possible displacements do not violate our constraints and thus we call them kinematically admissible. So we do not shorten the pen, we can only move in a tangent. So let's introduce a new notation. This is also called the D'Alembert form because we don't want to write this one every time. We can just replace it with a sum. So we have the mass times the acceleration in direction i minus the force that is acting on, this, on the particle in direction i and the unknown reaction force. And of course, they have to be equal to each other and thus it's equal to zero. So this is a dynamic equilibrium. And now we do the principle of virtual work. To do the principle of virtual work, we basically project our equilibrium, so this is our equilibrium, onto our virtual displacements. So we call this basically our force F, and this is our delta U, this is our possible virtual displacement, so the direction our particle could move to. And force times displacement into direction of the force is equal to work. So this is our virtual work. And now you might think, well, we had a complicated system and now we made it even more complicated because we had unknowns u, we had unknowns r, and we have now unknowns uh, delta, uh, du. So in our case, we know where the system could move, but if the system is more complicated, it will get difficult to find the possible displacements. But for now, let's focus on the pendulum because we know where our pendulum is going. So we met, we had a complex system, we made it a bit more complicated, but this will actually help us. Because if we look at it in vector notation, we have m times, this is our u's, u double dots minus the forces, minus the reaction forces, all this transpose times delta u. And we will know, look what is happening with the reaction forces. So why are we doing this whole thing? Well, the reaction forces actually disappear from our equations. So we had our possible displacements and we see that the reaction forces are always into, their, into the direction of our rigid link and our possible displacements are orthogonal. And if we do the projection now, the reaction forces, because they are orthogonal, they disappear. So if we look at this example right here again, we have a 90 degree angle between our constraint direction and our virtual displacement. 
So the reaction forces actually disappear and we do not have to talk about them anymore when we do the projected uh, equations, so our projected dynamic equilibrium onto the directions compatible with the constraints. So the reaction forces do not occur in the projected directions compatible with the constraints. This has to be gone. In projected directions compatible with the constraints. So if we know that, we can get just rid of the reaction forces. We can get, sorry for that. We can get rid of the reaction forces here and we only live left with that one. This might be a little complicated at first, but if we look at an example, you will see that this is very, very good for us because we can get rid of the reaction forces and we don't see them in our equation of motion anymore. So let's look at an example. We again have our pendulum. We have our dynamics, dynamic equilibrium that we had before. So we have m double dot mu one double dot. So acceleration in direction one is gravity plus some reaction force. The same for mass in direction two. So mass times displacement or acceleration in direction two. Zero gravity, but some reaction force. We know that our position one is cosine theta times L, derive it once, derive it twice. And we have the U1 double dot. The same for two, we have sine theta times L, derive it once, derive it twice. And we have U2 double dot. We know that our reaction forces are like this. So we have a reaction force in this direction. If theta is here, it's also here. And we know that have we have here the cosine, the cosine, and here we have the sine. So we have minus cosine theta times r in direction one, and minus sine theta times r because we're going in the opposite direction in every case. So this direction is opposite to this, and this one is opposite to that, and that's why we have a minus. And now we can formulate our equation of motion. So we have here our vector notation, and right now just check if r transpose du uh, delta u is actually zero. So here we have r transpose times our delta u. We multiply this one with that one, and this one with this one. We extract the r and we see that we have sine theta cosine theta minus sine theta cosine theta. So this cancels out and we have zero. So our idea that the reaction forces vanished that we had right there is true. So we are only left with this equation. If we write that equation, we have here our accelerations, so mass accelerations. This is our force of gravity, so acceleration g and our possible virtual displacements. If we multiply this one and that one, this one times this one, like, don't forget the transpose, we get this equation. And from here, we can simplify it because we see we have, the, we have this one and that one. And this is the sine cosine and the sine cosine, but here we have a minus and here we have a plus. So together they are zero. Here we have a minus cosine squared and here we have a minus sine squared. So minus cosine squared and minus sine squared will be minus one. So we're left with minus L theta double dot. And if we combine what's left here and that, we're left with this equation. To simplify it or make it more beautiful, we multiply it with minus one and we're left with the all known equation for a simple pendulum. So sine theta times g times L theta double dot. I hope I could give you a small introduction on how the principle of virtual work is helpful to us to get the equations of motion because we, to summarize, we're doing a projection of all the forces that we have in our system onto directions compatible with the constraints. And by doing that, our reaction forces vanish. So we simplify it and we then get the equations of motion. 
I hope this video gave you a small understanding. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them down below. Thank you very much and see you next time.